Thanks, Wesley, and thank you, band. You know, Greg is right. Uh, a lot of the time when I'm trying to make decisions, I stop and I ask myself, is this punk enough, what I'm about to do? So I'm just so punk rock, and you don't even know it because I've been keeping that from you, but I do hope that in years to come, I have a chance to share that more with you all. Why don't we pray again, because it, that's a pretty punk thing to do. Lord, thanks again for this morning. Thanks for your mercies, which are always new. Thanks for your faithfulness. Pray that the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts would be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. My freshman year of college, I came up with this idea that a couple of friends of mine and I were going to do. We were each going to get individualized t-shirts made. I was going to have one that said Tennessee in big block letters across the top, and then under that it would say philosophy. My roommate was going to have one that said Iowa, computer science. And my friend down the hall was going to have one that said Illinois, philosophy and English. It didn't, wouldn't work so well if you were a double or triple major. But our thinking was that as freshmen coming into school, the two questions that we heard all the time were, where are you from? What's your major? And we figured if we had t-shirts made up, we could just sort of circumvent that superficial conversation and jump right into the deeper stuff. Sometimes if people were a little bit more competitive, they might ask a third question, which is, what's your SAT score? <laughs> Those could kind of be the jersey numbers on the back there. But we decided against that for obvious reasons. It was a little antisocial. But I did get tired of having to answer those questions in college, as you may as well. Where are you from? What's your major? And besides that, it was always a little bit confusing to me to know how to answer that question, where are you from? Sometimes people, to be a little creative, would say, where's home for you? So am I supposed to answer Tennessee, the state from which I've come, the Nashville area, to go to school? Or am I supposed to say that home for me is the dorm or the apartment that I'm currently living in? Or do they mean it in some sort of metaphysical sense? I feel most at home when I'm playing ultimate Frisbee on the quad. Where is home for you? It's kind of a, I see we got some Frisbee fans out here. It's a good place to call home. But even how I answered that question throughout college changed each year. I was inclined my freshman year to think in terms of my nuclear family. That's where home is. But as sophomore year went on and then junior year and senior year, I might be more inclined to say that home is my school. It's my group of friends. It's my roommates. But even then, I knew that I wasn't going to stay there forever and that I'd soon graduate and go on and make a new home. So where was home for me? And I'm wondering, where is home for you? I still get that question. I just started at Gordon in the chapel office this fall. We've been in the greater Boston area since 2008. And so uh, in some sense, I'm from here, though certainly not originally. Uh, before that, I was in Northern Virginia. And in Northern Virginia, I was the director of youth ministry at a great church, a good-sized church with multiple staff and lots of wonderful volunteers, lots of good middle school and high school students. Here's a picture of the church where I worked. Beautiful church. You can see the trees, and there's just green everywhere, just a lush campus and a great place. Northern Virginia was a great place to live because there, it was just a real hub of different cultures that came together. So there were always lots of interesting people to meet, great restaurants there, uh, lots of things to learn. Northern Virginia is also known for its traffic. This is what Northern Virginia interstates look like. But that's just on the weekends. Here's what it looks like during the weekdays, I-66 or 495, the Beltway, if anyone has had the privilege of driving on those. This is how they merge in Northern Virginia. <laughs> and that's not a joke. And sometimes it rains a lot in Northern Virginia. We would get, uh, occasionally, the main roads and the interstates would flood a little bit. So we, Northern Virginians, being a resourceful people, would take to our boats. There's inter Interstate 66 during a flood. Well, when I was at this church, I learned some difficult lessons about productivity and time management. I, uh, my first two years, I did a good job building relationships with young people, but a bad job managing a sizable youth ministry. So I was fortunate to have somebody from the church kind of step in as a coach and do an intervention with me and really help me through issues of time management and productivity, which is something I'm still always working on. And in fact, an open invitation, if any of you would ever like to come talk to me and hear my story and some of my failures and then what I've learned from that, 
I'd love to share that with you. I'm just on the second floor of the chapel. But perhaps what was most effective to me was my steering wheel desk for time management and productivity. I found that I could get so much done as I was stalled in traffic. You see, you got a smartphone there. It's a Blackberry. I don't know if they make Blackberries anymore, but got the notebook and you can have that there. This is a real product, by the way, on Amazon. I don't really own one. I wish I did sometimes, but uh, let me just read you a review of of this, and I don't know if you can see that text, but you wouldn't believe how much more interesting my commute is now that I have something better to do other than just stare out the window. I'm using it right now to post this review, and I never... (laughs) Unfortunately, when I was reading this at my desk yesterday, I had just taken a big sip of coffee which uh, perhaps is why my computer wasn't working very well this morning. (laughs) But I really enjoyed my time of youth ministry at that church. It was a wonderful time, and we finally felt after four and a half years like we had made a real home there. And then we started to sense God calling us to leave that home, to come to the greater Boston area, to go to graduate school, Uh, me for seminary and my wife to do pre-med studies. I still remember being in the car driving to Boston, seeing signs like this, just getting giddy with excitement to come to this wonderful place that I've so enjoyed being for the last four years. We had grad school in mind, but what we didn't have when we decided to move was jobs or a place to live. So we were either really obedient to God or really stupid. We think we were hearing God clearly, and it seems to have worked out so far, so I'm going to assume that it was obedient and not stupid. But it felt a little bit scary to be driving in the car with our 10-month-old son and all of our belongings packed up and no jobs and no place to live as we came here. We thought about our biblical namesakes, and yes, my wife's name is Sarah. (laughs) And we thought about how Abraham and Sarah in the Bible were called to leave their country. I was always looking for a Sarah growing up. (laughs) I I found the best one. She's great. But Abraham and Sarah were called to leave their country, their land, their, their people, their family, and their father's household, and to go to the land that God would show them. God didn't tell Abraham and Sarah much of anything about the land that they were going to when he called them in Genesis 12. And in the same way, when we went to Boston, we didn't get much of an indication of what it would be like. It was just the call, go, leave your church, leave your jobs, leave the people that you love and know here, and go to the place that I'll show you. And I often wonder, how would Abraham and Sarah have answered if you had asked them, where is home for you? I think about that, what would they have said? Wesley read from Hebrews 11 this morning, And it says in another part of that chapter that Abraham and his family sojourned by living in tents. These tents were temporary dwelling places. Abraham was in a land that was not his own. He and Sarah were in a temporary in-between space. And so I wonder again, where is home for you? Do you ever feel like you're living in a temporary in between space, just like Abraham and his family did. In some sense, I think the answer to that has to be yes, if you're a student, because you're only here for four years and then you graduate, or in some cases, five years, six years, seven years. But either way, you know that college is a time of in-betweenness. Sociologists refer to in-between times as liminal times, you're liminal, you're, you're not fully here and you're not fully there, you're somewhere in between. A guy named Christopher Moody who was chaplain at King's College talks about a feeling that exists among young adults in college. He describes the feeling of being unhoused and in transit, having left the familiar behind, neither able to return to it nor yet with a clear idea of what one was destined for and no clear idea on one's ability to get there. I have a question for you if you don't mind raising your hands. I'm just curious, how many of you have some of your possessions in storage somewhere that is not here at Gordon? Some of the stuff that you own, that's a good solid number of you. And I don't know how attached you are to those particular 
possessions, but it is that sense of being unhoused and in transit. You don't maybe have all your stuff with you. It might not all fit in your dorm room or your apartment. This uh, weekend, Dr. Carmer gave a great workshop. We were at the LEAD conference, and he talked about emerging adults, which a phrase is sometimes used to refer to your age group. Among emerging adults, there's a sense of autonomy and responsibility, uh, yet you all are often still classified as adolescents, whether you should be or not, that's another uh, topic, but uh, maybe not in every way completely independent from your parents. Uh, some or many of you may still be sending tuition payments, at least, back home uh, to mom and dad. And there can be a heightened stress of conflict when you uh, go through a, a year of school and then maybe come home and live with your family again in the summer or even after you graduate and you're used to living on your own and then all of a sudden the curfew somehow magically kicks back in. Has anyone had that experience or was that just me? Okay, I had that a little bit. And the rules that applied when you were in high school apply back when you were uh, when you're in college. I got into a lot of trouble my freshman year when I was out with my younger brother who was three years younger than I am and we were talking with a friend the summer after my freshman year until one in the morning. Well, my brother was like 16 at the time. And it didn't even occur to me that it was a problem for my 16-year-old brother to be out at one in the morning without me having called my parents. So that was my mistake. But I wouldn't have had to do that when I was living in the dorm. So there's a, a sense of feeling unsettled there. But your time of being here at Gordon is an important time of differentiation and identity formation. You may be seeking to differentiate yourself from your families or your community's belief systems, but still seeking to preserve some sort of a core spiritual identity. You don't want to just give it all up. And while this can lead to a really healthy spiritual openness and a desire to go deeper in your faith, it can be difficult. It can be unsettling. You may find yourself reading things and hearing things in a classroom setting that you're just, you have no idea how to fit that with all the stuff you came in with, with, with everything that you believe when you came into Gordon. Or maybe you grew up in an urban center and you could just walk to everything that you needed to get to. Or you could take public transportation. We're here in Wenham. The closest train stop is North Beverly and to get there, you, I guess you could walk that, but that's pretty far. So now you're sort of subject to the, the whims and the good graces of fellow community members and posting on the student news online uh, to get somewhere. So if that's your story, if you come from a city and come to Wenham, maybe there's discomfort there. And if that's you, what's home? What's, is home the city that you grew up in that you came from, where you maybe feel more comfortable and know how to get around? Or is home here now? I think of our international students and the many of you who study abroad each year. Crossing borders, as they call it, is difficult work. And it can really challenge a person's sense of identity. So where is home for you? Is it your country of origin? Is it the place where you just spent six months and really put down roots? And then what do you do if you've been studying abroad and you come back to Gordon and Gordon looks and feels to you nothing like it did when you left because you've changed so much? Where is home for you then? Home is a difficult thing to pin down. And what about church? Maybe you're in your third year here and you still don't have a home church that you found. Or maybe you came to Gordon with one denominational background but are really questioning some things about it due to your experience here. I had a very surreal experience a couple years ago. I was the youth minister at a congregational church in Wakefield. I did that part-time. I was attending an Episcopal church and somehow I made those things work. Where it got really bizarre was when it came time for confirmation. Uh, in my tradition, it's not uncommon for uh, adults to be confirmed, and I had not been confirmed. I was baptized when I was 12 and wanted to be confirmed in my church's tradition. So a couple years ago, I signed up to take the confirmation classes at my church. Well, at the same time, in the congregational church, the youth confirmation classes for those young people were happening. And fortunately, they were spaced apart such that I could attend both. But for four weeks, I went to confirmation class as a student at my home Episcopal church. I ran out the door, I literally sprinted to my car. I drove just a little bit over the speed limit from, or maybe a lot, from Hamilton to Wakefield, then to get to the confirmation class that I was teaching. 
And those 30 minutes in the car moving from student being confirmed in one denomination to teacher confirming other students in another denomination, those 30 minutes, those 30 minutes each week were just bizarre. I mean, talk about an in-between time, a kind of no man's land, if you will. <coughs> And I didn't feel disingenuous about it at all. The way I figured it's the same one church, right? The same God, the same Lord, the same Jesus. We're being confirmed ultimately in our faith in Jesus. And so that's how I could be confirmed in one tradition and confirm others in another tradition. But maybe you've had a similar kind of in-between experience with regard to church affiliation. Well, our chapel theme this semester has been the salt of the earth. Dr. Karmer mentioned again in his message Monday that salt is valuable because it seasons and it purifies and it preserves the things with which it comes into contact. There's a salt phrase from the Bible that we haven't mentioned yet this semester, and that phrase is a covenant of salt. A covenant of salt. It appears just a few times in the Old Testament. Now, the Old Testament sacrificial system, salt was an important ingredient because it preserved the the burnt offerings, the animal sacrifices, but it was also a symbol of God's covenant, which is preserved for all time. Salt in sacrifices was meant to show that God's covenant is everlasting. It's eternal. It doesn't change. It doesn't go away. A covenant of salt And so we see in Ezekiel 43, 24, it says, Bring the bull and ram near before the Lord, and the priests will scatter salt on them and will offer them up as burnt offerings to the Lord. And then in 2 Chronicles 13, 5, talking about the permanence of David's kingship, it says, Don't you know that the Lord God of Israel has given dominion over Israel to David and his descendants forever by a covenant of salt? The covenant of salt refers to the permanence of God's covenant. Nothing can change it. It's totally secure and preserved for all time. Even when his people change and even when they forget or are fickle as we sometimes are, God is not any of those things. He always remains just like salt. In fact, even Etsy has gotten in on this covenant of salt thing. Apparently, and hopefully nobody is looking this up right now, but apparently this is a thing that people are doing at weddings now. The wife and the husband have these little salt pouches, which you can see behind me, and as part of the wedding ceremony, they take salt from each of the pouches and take the spoon and they put it inside this giant egg, which in this case is an eco-friendly egg, thankfully. It's sort of substituting for the unity candle, if you've ever seen that at weddings. I saw on one church's website where the minister had a a full explanation of the covenant of salt. And he said, if you want to do this covenant of salt, you can. But it's absolutely essential that the salt be of the same color for the man and the woman. Because otherwise, if you mix it back in, you might be able to separate it back out if you should change your mind down the road or something like that. So the, the husband and the wife put in the same color salt into this egg and it shows you that they're they're one. But it's about the permanence. Look, even Pinterest has it now. (laughs) But covenant of salt comes from the Old Testament. One of the other times we see covenant of salt is in the Old Testament during a time when Israel was asking themselves, where is home for us? It's in the book of Numbers. The Hebrew title for, for the book of Numbers in Hebrew is In the Wilderness, we call it numbers in our Bible because there are two censuses. There's a, a big sense, which always makes for gripping reading. But it is important stuff that that's in there. Uh, numbers 1, which is just kind of seeing who's there. And then Numbers 26, which is a second census after some plagues and some wilderness travelings. Just to kind of see, okay, who's still here? Where's Auntie Gertrude? Did, did we lose her? Oh, there she is, right there. So Numbers is about the two censuses, but the... In the wilderness title in the Hebrew Bible, I think, describes well what's going on there. Israel is just wandering through the wilderness. They've been called out of Egypt and into the promised land, but they're not there yet. So they're in an awkward, difficult, liminal time, if you want to call it that. Probably asking the question, where is home? Their identity as citizens of Israel may not have been in question, but they're no longer residents of Egypt, and they're not yet residents of Canaan. So where was home for them? And therefore, where was hope for them? After one particular incident in Numbers 17, 
they cried out, we will die, we will die. All of us are going to die. Which might have been something that you heard in Lane at one point this week as folks are preparing for final papers and exams. It's not an uncommon response to too much time in the wilderness with no home in sight. And so with the people of God calling out for help, God tells the people that they'll be saved by the sacrifices offered on their behalf by Aaron and his family and Levi and his tribe. You get the priests and the Levites. And so in Numbers 18, you get another occurrence of this phrase, covenant of salt. Whatever is set aside from the holy offerings the Israelites present to the Lord, I give to you and your sons and daughters as your regular share. This is an everlasting covenant of salt in the presence of the Lord with you and your descendants. I think it's interesting that God doesn't seem to feel much of a need in the book of Numbers to say, it's okay, just hold on, you'll be there soon. Because the book of Numbers actually starts in the second year of what will be 40 years of wilderness wanderings. Instead, he says, it's okay, I'm here, I will be with you. My covenant has not changed. It's a covenant of salt. It's permanent. In fact, all of Israel's wilderness life was organized around the tent of meeting, the place that signified God's presence. So they had a constant physical reminder right in the middle of them that God was there. Their whole lives were centered and organized around God. Now, thankfully, we're past the days of animal sacrifice. And as we sang in the song in Christ Alone, we know that on the cross, the wrath of God was satisfied. The punishment that we deserved, that the whole animal sacrifice system was set up for, that's all been satisfied in Jesus. A once for all sacrifice, it says in Hebrews. So we don't have to offer animal sacrifices, or don't get to, depending on how you feel about that. And we know from our New Testament classes that those of us who call on the name of Jesus now are God's people. So this stuff to Israel about the covenant of salt now, although it's in a different way, still applies to us. This God has not changed. He preserves his covenant with a covenant of salt. He does not go back on his word. And while this is a strong enough truth for us to dwell on by itself, what I want to highlight is the context in which these promises come. The book of Numbers, where God affirms this covenant. Israel was in the wilderness saying, we're going to die, we're going to die. Does nobody care about us? God says, yes, I do. And I'm confirming it with the covenant of salt. God's not giving his people a simple Sunday school answer here. Rather, he's re-upping his commitment, even in the midst of their feeling unhoused and in transition. He's pledging to be the settled one, to be their home base, even when home is otherwise an elusive term. So take just a moment now and think, what for you are some tensions that you're experiencing right now? In what ways do you feel like you might be walking in a wilderness or living in some uncomfortable in-between place? Are you experiencing this with regard to your cultural identity? Do you feel tension around your faith and what you believe? You're not sure fully what that is anymore? Or are you still stuck on deciding what you want to major in? And so you're literally in between majors as a Gordon student. Are you starting to feel unhoused, knowing that Actually, literally, in a couple weeks, you are going to be unhoused, many of you, and go live somewhere else for the summer or for a longer period of time than that. So rather than asking, where is home for you, now I want you to ask, where are the places in your life where you feel not at home? Where do you experience tension? And I want to give you some time to think about a response to that question. Uh, To help us do that, I'm going to show a short music video from the band U2. The song is called A Sort of Homecoming. It's from the mid-80s, so perhaps this shows some of my own in-betweenness that 25 years later I still love this song. But pay careful attention to the lyrics and to the images. The title is not Homecoming, it's A Sort of Homecoming. And it's about some of the in-betweenness that you too was feeling as they were on tour in the mid-80s, on the road, wondering probably what their home was. So watch for images that suggest transition and being unsettled and see how you can enter in to those feelings and those images.
But even in the midst of that, watch in the video for this longing and this yearning for home. Just a few lyrics to point out for you to listen for. On the borderland we run, on the borderland we run, and still we run, we run and we don't look back. I'll be there. And then it says, tonight we'll build a bridge across the sea and land. I'll be there. So take some time to ask yourself as we watch, where in my life am I feeling not at home? Where am I feeling transitional? the borderland we run and still we run we run and don't look back I'll be there I'll be there love the way the song closes and your heart beats so slow through the rain and fallen snow across the fields of morning to a light that's in the distance oh don't sorrow no don't weep for tonight at last I am coming home I am coming home where is home for you Even the difficult in-between places can be home for us. There's no need, as Bono points out, to to, to weep or to fret or be discouraged by the awkwardness of times of transition because we can find rest and a true home even in temporary dwelling places. Why? Because of God, because of the covenant of salt that he has with his people. His faithfulness endures from age to age, from transition to transition, from country to country, from denomination to denomination, from class to class, from community to community, from one home to the next and everywhere in between. God's building a new creation and he uses in-between spaces to make a new creation out of us. We may run on borderlands, unsure of which way to turn, but as we do so, We can look to God and hear his assurance and his promise. I'll be there. I'll be there. Go in the assurance of that knowledge.